Thank you. Thank you very much, Daisy. And uh, it's just always a joy to be with 5x15, but especially with this extraordinary group today. And I have to say that no young man has been more appropriately named Merlin than our previous speaker. Um, it's just wonderful to be with you, Merlin, and I really admire your research. You know, travelers um, often become enchanted with the first country that sort of captures their imagination and allows them to be free. And for me, that certainly was Colombia. Uh, the vast wetlands, the mountains, the Amazonian forests opened up a kind of a visionary world to me that I would spend the rest of my life really exploring. And this sort of strange affair, this love between a boy uh, and a country and its people began innocently enough when I was 14 in 1968, when my mother, a, a simple but determined um, Canadian woman, um, told me that uh, Spanish was a language of the future. And she worked very hard to allow me the, the funds to go off and join a school group that a teacher was bringing to Colombia. And I was very fortunate because as the other lads were with wealthy families in the sort of sweltering streets of Cali, I was with a more modest family in the, in the mountains above the city. And whereas some of the other lads felt what the Colombians call mamitis or homesick, I felt by contrast that I had finally found home. And six years later, I returned to Columbia with just a, a backpack of clothes and two books, Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass and a book on the taxonomy of vascular plants. And I, both figuratively and literally, I drank from every stream. I felt that bliss was an objective state. And naturally, I was, that could be achieved just by opening yourself un unabashedly to the world. And naturally, I was always sick. But even that seemed part of the process, sort of malarial fevers that broke in the dawn and rose in the evening. Um, at one point on a day's notice, I agreed to guide an eccentric British journalist across the notorious Darien Gap. And after a month and a half, we, I emerged from the forest, um, having been lost for 14 days with no food and no shelter, uh, drenched in vomit by my fellow passengers on a small little plane with $3 to my name and only the ragged clothes on my back in Panama. And I had ne never felt so alive. And along the, the way, I became an acolyte of the legendary um, botanical explorer, Richard Evan Schultes, who had also found his life in Columbia. And when I would get around to writing his biography, a book that uh, was called One River, um, by the, it was inevitable that the book would be kind of a love letter to a nation that by then was scorned by the world. And when the Spanish translation, El Rio, came out in 2002, Colombia was very much um, a failed state. And a book on botanical exploration with a limited print run of 500 copies should not have warranted much attention. But the strength of the book was the quality of the translation and the fact that it became for two generations of young people, in a sense, um, a, a map of dreams accounts of journeys that they could not physically make because of the insecurity in their own country. And by that point, Colombia had really become a pariah nation. You know, political leaders were mocked in the federal, in the national and international press. Carolina Barco, the former uh, for, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, ambassador to Washington, daughter of a president, was famously strip searched at Washington Dulles Airport simply because she was Colombian. And when she expressed her diplomatic reservations and objections, the customs person simply barked at her in obscenity as if echoed from the mouth of a dog. And of course, most Colombians have never used or seen cocaine, but they've dealt with the consequences of the trade for two generations. For four terrible years, in the late 1990s, a kidnapping occurred in Colombia every three hours of every day. Um, by 2012, five million Colombians had either by choice or through uh, obligation fled their country. Internally within the country, there were seven million uh, people internally displaced. You know, how would the United States feel if Canada had patterns of drug consumption in bars and boardrooms across our country and drug laws that facilitated an illicit trade but did nothing to quell that trade, the consequence of which would imply 85 million Americans would be forced to flee 
their homes, you can get a sense of what Colombia has, has in fact endured. And the book El Rio kind of resonated with um, Colombians because it exposed those cruel hypocrisies, even as it painted a portrait of a nation utterly in defiance of the dark cliches. Yes, it's true that Colombia um, has been haunted by this chemical extract of a plant used for 4,000 years and known as a divine leaf of immortality, a plant that's been used with no evidence of toxicity, let alone addiction, for all of that time. Element, elemental, fundamental to the nutritional regime of the people. And it has been convulsed by 50 years of war, 220,000 dead, uh, the missing numbering close to 100,000. Every family has suffered. Yet in a nation of 52 million people, there were never more than 200,000 combatants on all three sides of the war. And so for the vast majority of, of Colombian people, they have been innocent victims caught in the vice of war, a war that been, has been fueled exclusively by the illicit profits from the cocaine trade, profits that became so extraordinary, $70 million a day to the Medellin cartel, the Medellin cartel at its height budgeting $1,000 a week just to buy elastic bands to wrap the illicit cash in. Um, without that money, the, 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 the war would have fizzled out within years of its, of its beginning. And so in a sense, you know, ultimate responsibility for Colombia's agony surely lies with every individual who's ever bought and used illicit street cocaine and every country that has facilitated that market by forbidding the drug but doing very little to quell its use. And after all of the violence and millions and billions of dollars spent in a war on drugs, there are more people using more drugs in worse ways than ever before. But Colombia most assuredly is not a place of violence and drugs. It's a place of colores y cariño, where the people have endured uh, this agony because of their character, which is informed by a kind of enduring spirit of place and a deep love of, of a land that is biologically and ecologically by far the most rich and biodiverse um, on the planet. And it speaks volumes of the spirit of the Colombian people that through all of these years of difficulty, they've maintained civil society, uh, maintained democracy, greened their cities, uh, created millions of acres of national parks, sought restitution with the First Nations of the country, and paved their way for an economic and cultural renaissance, uh, unprecedented in the history of Latin America, as literally thousands of young kids forced to flee the country are now returning from every capital of the world with skill sets in every conceivable um, uh, uh, vocation. And everything hangs in the balance. Um, one of the great benefits of the war, if there is a single benefit, is that vast reaches of the country uh, have been left alone, away from the sweep of development that has ravaged so much of the world. Countries like Ecuador that made decisions in the 1970s that have laid, laid waste to the eastern forests. The Amazon of Colombia, literally the size of France, uh, though now threatened, nevertheless remains essentially roadless. And so Colombia has this incredible possibility to re-envision its future. It's had been granted a kind of reprieve from the forces of modernity that have caused so much damage. And it can now make these decisions informed by a new level of understanding of the importance of both biological and cultural diversity that simply didn't exist uh, 50 years ago. But everything holds in the balance. And as this friend of mine, Mamo Camillo, once said in a passage that I shared with President Juan Manuel Santos, you know, peace won't matter if it's only an excuse for the three sides to come together and maintain a war against nature. And so for the country to heal, it will have to find its way to forgiveness. In a short story by, by uh, Jorge Luis Borjas, uh, a, a European woman asks the professor in Bogota what it means to be Colombian, and he hesitates for a moment, and then he replies, I don't know, it's an act of faith. And Colombia truly is like that. Nothing is as expected. Magical realism celebrated as Colombia's great gift to Latin American literature 
is within the nation only simple journalism. Gabo, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, of course, was a journalist, an observer, an active journalist all his life, who just happened to live in a land where heaven and earth converge on a regular basis to reveal glimpses of the divine. Only in Colombia can you wash ashore in a coastal desert, follow wet uh, forests through uh, waterways and wetlands as wide as the sky and ascend narrow tracks into the mountains to reach temperate landscapes as soft as any to be found in the old world. There is no place in Colombia more than a day's journey from every known natural habitat to be found on earth. Cities as cultures as, as any in the Americas were for most of their history linked one to another only by trails covered by mules. And over time, the kind of wild and impossible um, geography found its perfect coefficient in the topography of the Colombian spirit, a people that are restive and potent and at times placid and calm and in moments tortured and twisted like a mountain that shakes and crumbles and falls away into the sea. And so within Colombia, magic becomes the, um, the antidote to fear and uncertainty and reality comes into focus through the reassuring lens of the phantasmagoric. And there was certainly magic involved in the, in the genesis of this new book of mine, Magdalena, River of Dreams. I was invited to Columbia by a group of scientists and photographers and journalists who had been given the opportunity to do five illustrated books in the five great regions of Columbia. And these books were not to be sold, but gifted to every library in the country to send a message to a new generation of young people that theirs was not a country of violence and war and kidnapping and drugs, but rather a country of the greatest ecological diversity and biological bounty to be found on the planet. I remember a wonderful campesino, a fisherman who had stood up uh, in defiance of every guerrilla and paramilitary group who came through his community and around a small little wetland that you could walk around in a short morning, he and the local school children had found 75 different species of butterflies. And I said to Morita, that's incredible, man. In Canada, we only have perhaps twice as many in the second largest country in the world. And he looked at me, saw, ah, but the thing is, he said, you know, in Colombia, un mariposa es solamente un flor que puede volar. Es por eso que tenemos tanto. In Colombia, a butterfly is just a flower that has learned to fly. And that's why we have so many. And so I had the opportunity to study the, um, the, the, the Magdalena as a metaphor for the country. Uh, in a sense, writing my own love letter to the nation, writing a biography of Colombia through the river that is both like the Mississippi, its shadow to the north, a corridor of commerce, but more importantly, a fountain of culture, the, the source of music and poetry and literature and prayer. And the journey that in the end would consume five years was kind of sociology by serendipity. I would go to any village in the enormous Cuenca, where four out of five Colombians live, the source of 80% of the nation's wealth, the, the source of the power that lights the great cities, and I would just wait until there was someone I met who had something to say that the world needed to hear, which as Hemingway said, was the foundation of great storytelling. This woman here, Adelpha, who told me that in her village of Murillo, God disappeared when they assassinated Jorge Gaetan, the great voice of the poor in 1948. But God returned, she told me, on one night. And that was a fateful night when half of Nevada de Ruiz blasted apart with the greatest explosion of volcanic eruption in the history of Latin America and a literal river of hundreds of millions of tons of debris came right down onto her village and suddenly it went the other side of a ridge and not a single person died even as she stood like a kind of an anchor with her children in the darkness with black snow rain falling and ash as she read their faces in the darkness like braille to see that they were still all with her at her side the resilience of Colombians. You know, when you go to Colombia, it's a little bit like the stories that would come out of the Soviet Union where Max Hastings, the famous British 
uh, historian uh, would say, he'd speak to someone who would say, oh, my sister was killed in this gulag. And someone else would say, oh, my father died there too, as if they had discovered they had gone to the same public school together. Well, Columbia is like that. You're sitting at a table and someone says, my father was kidnapped and killed here. And someone else will say, oh, yes, that's where my aunt was held as well. So everybody has suffered. Nobody has been untouched. And yet the spirit of the Colombian people uh, continues here in a place called Puerto Barreo, where the river had become the cemetery of the nation, where the paramilitaries would cast the dead, having slaughtered and dismembered them, having told the people, leave the dead, the dead, because if you touch them, we will kill you. And instead, the people defied the paramilitaries, carried the dead out of the river, baptized them with the names of their own deceased allowing them to re-enter the sacred cycle of life, death, and rebirth, escaping purgatory, allowing them to reach the doors of heaven. And so the culture of Columbia comes from the river. The river is a source of music. It's said in Columbia, ethnomusicologists, it's said that to be a, a land of a thousand rhythms, ethnomusicologists have actually found 1,025. And as Carlos Vivas, a great Colombian a uh, popular musician and rock star told me, every one of our rhythms comes from the river. The river is a source of the music. To heal ourselves, we must heal the river. To heal the river, we must heal ourselves. And so you see this fountain of culture. This man who has toured the world with his little, uh, little um, pan pipe, and yet only he wants to live in his community because he says that if this little vessel is away for too long from the birds, it will lose its voice. His only goal in life is to have a dialogue with the birds that gather every morning in the mango tree that hovers over his hut. This is a story of Colombia. In the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, at the base of it, the great Cienega del Rio, uh, uh, the, uh, Cienega Grande de Santa Marta, this great wetland that shines like a mirror to the sky. In 2003, this modest floating fishing a village of Nueva Venecia, where the cats swim and the dogs are afraid of water, a terrible massacre occurred. But new generations have grown up. And when I asked a fisherman what the government might do to offer some kind of compensation for their suffering, the first thing he said is, we need new houses. But then he said, no, no, we don't need new houses. What good is a house if we don't have the bounty of the Sienega? We have to clean up the Sienega. Then I hesitated as he changed his mind. And he said, no, the Sienega doesn't matter if we don't fix the canals coming in, the channels coming into the Sienega. And then he hesitated yet again. He said, no, no, what good will that be if we don't clean the river itself, the Mother Magdalena? That's what we need. Cleaning the river will clean our soul. Cleaning our soul is to clean the river. And finally, here's a, an image of, of contemporary Colombia, just to reveal to you the greatest danger you face if you travel to Colombia. It's that you'll never want to come home. Here's a sign of the danger of Colombia. Lovers in the street, 3 a.m., practicing their salsa. My companion on the journey, my companion in writing the book, Sandra Uribe, once told me that we named the river Magdalena at a time when Maria Magdalena was seen to be a woman of the night. Now, a generation um, ago, they took the scarlet letter of sin off of Maria Magdalena's body, and now Pope Francis has named her the Apostle of the Apostles, the one and only, the, the spiritual watchtower of the world, the one who stood by Christ in his death, and was the first to announce the glory of his ascent. And Sandra said to me, why can't we do that to the river? And the moment she said that, a little yellow bird landed on our table, pecked at the crumbs, and flew off into the cloud forest. <laughs>